So to get our program started, I want to uh, introduce our, our first uh, keynote speaker, uh, and that's Dr. Eugene Kunin from the National Center for Biotechnology Information at NIH. Eugene, um, who has become a, a very good friend of mine uh, over the past number of years, is, is really one of the most brilliant minds in bioinformatics and also in the CRISPR field uh, today. Uh, Eugene has been working on CRISPR before there was even CRISPR. Uh, so in fact, um, he had uh, discovered uh, these CRISPR uh, systems, the proteins, uh, way before uh, this thing called CRISPR was even named. And in 2006, he had proposed um, or published a seminal paper that proposed how this whole CRISPR system works. And, uh, and he examined the different enzymes in the CRISPR system and identified the, the workhorse of genome engineering, uh, Cas9, having two different nuclease domains, the HNH domain and also the RubC domain. And since then, um, he has um, carried on. He really led um, all the entire community to put together the, the classification of different kinds of CRISPR systems, uh, the nomenclature of class one and class two, and also the different types of CRISPR systems really is something that Eugene uh, had come up with and, and led the field to, uh, to become more organized. Most recently, um, and, and this is something that I had the, the great fortune to be a part of, uh, has been the continued uh, exploration and discovery of new CRISPR systems. And working with Eugene um, and, and taking uh, some of the uh, bioinformatics and computational predictions that Eugene had created uh, to identify uh, new uh, class two CRISPR systems, uh, we had uh, collaborated to develop uh, new enzymes uh, like CPF1 or Cas13 uh, for various applications. And uh, I won't tell you too much more uh, because Eugene is a much better storyteller than me. Um, and, uh, and let's welcome Eugene uh, to to uh, give his keynote. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here for me. It's my third workshop like this, and it has been wonderful two years with Fung and others um, journey for the CRISPR world. Uh, world. Um, so, um, I I put the title in the program several months ago, charting the CRISPR world, uh, which was very general. Uh, I was not really sure in what manner I was going to chart it for you. Uh, but then it occurred to me that you know, there is really one subject that I'm most interested in. Uh, and this is the uh, relationship between uh, CRISPR-Cas systems and Cas genes uh, and various kinds of uh, mobile elements. The richness of this relationship, the versatility and diversity, or the contributions of uh, mobile elements to the evolution and functioning of the CRISPR-Cas system uh, turned out to be beyond our imagination, and this is what I want to share with you. Uh, so, um, of course, we will go through the diversity of CRISPR themselves in the process. So, uh, uh, this is uh, the, so to speak, current classification of CRISPR-Cas system. Uh, um, current because uh, um, this was the latest dedicated paper on that subject, published less than two uh, um, uh, years ago. Uh, um, I put it in quotes, however, uh, because in reality it's hopeless, hopelessly obsolete by now. The important thing uh, um, about this classification was basically two important things. Uh, one was that we introduced class one and class two as major division of uh, CRISPR system with class one having multi-subunit uh, effector modules and uh, class two with all the effector activities uh, combined in one large party, um, such as Cas Cas9. And uh, the second important thing was that um, uh, the type five was introduced formally uh, in this um, classification and very soon followed up uh, by uh, uh, Fung and other labs, the rather spectacular effect. Uh, so, uh, right after developing this classification, or in the process of developing this, that classification, uh, we also uh, uh, developed a computational pipeline uh, for comprehensive discovery of novel uh, class uh, to uh, CRISPR-Cas systems. Uh, uh, this uh, is uh, embarrassingly simple approach, but, but still fairly efficient one. Uh, so what we do here 
of um, what is often actually done in genomic, various kinds of genomic analysis, is selecting a certain type of anchor, a certain type of signature of a, um, of a system uh, they are interested in. And there are uh, um, uh, two uh, such uh, anchors uh, for CRISPR-Cas searches, namely the arrays themselves, and the most conserved uh, uh, Cas1 uh, genes. It pays off to use both, because as you can see in, the, in this uh, Venn diagram, uh, the, the respective sets of genomic loci overlap only uh, partially. So there are many, as we will touch upon later, uh, there are many uh, arrays that do not have uh, adjacent cast genes, but then there are some uh, cas clusters of cast genes that do not have uh, arrays. And once you detect uh, uh, that anchor, you, you computationally and automatically explore its neighborhood and classify uh, mm, the surrounding genes uh, into uh, mm, uh, one of those subtypes that I showed on the previous slide. Those that do not classify are, of course, of special interest because they may represent something new. And if there are uncharacterized uh, mm, large proteins in these neighborhoods, then these are our candidates for, un for unknown uh, class two uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas systems. Uh, mm, so that exercise was over the last uh, mm, two years, almost to the day, uh, that uh, exercise uh, mm, uh, has been uh, mm, rather successful. Uh, so we uh, brought the number of known uh, subtypes of class two uh, from four to about 10. We are still working on, on potentially splitting uh, one of these uh, subtypes. Of course, this provides new opportunities for genome editing, RNA targeting, regulatory tools, detection tools, as demonstrated uh, by uh, uh, recent uh, development. And of course, we expect uh, the amendment of uh, CRISPR-Cas classification and Cas gene nomenclature. Uh, so, Nowadays, it's difficult to show one slide as a single tree, um, so we show both side by side in a uh, forthcoming review um, uh, with Kira Makarova and Fung, um, and I will not deal with class one, um, is not really talk at all about uh, class one now, um, but we'll um, say a couple of words uh, about class two. Uh, so we now have um, three uh, types in class two, or two, five, and six, non-consecutive uh, historically, and mm, mm, type five keeps uh, growing. Mm, mm, uh, so uh, mm, we have uh, mm, uh, described with uh, mm, found those three um, mm, uh, subtypes, and then in the more uh, mm, recent uh, mm, uh, work uh, from uh, Jill Benfields and Jennifer Downer's lab, uh, on uncultured bacteria, uh, these two uh, have been uh, discovered. And then we also describe this interesting <coughs> subtype 5U, uh, uh, which probably uh, includes the ancestral forms uh, to all this, all this uh, diversity. Uh, so this is still actively growing. And then we have uh, type 6, uh, which, as everyone probably already knows, includes uh, the dedicated RNA-specific CRISPR-Cas system already put to application. All right. So that, that was my way of introduction. That was all pretty much published recently. And now I will go to my main subject, and that is multiple, highly complex, diverse contributions of mobile genetic elements to the evolution of CRISPR-Cas system. And unexpectedly, also, the reciprocal contributions of CRISPR-Cas uh, uh, systems to the uh, evolution and functions of various kinds of model elements. So um, uh, this uh, uh, slide shows you uh, um, a brief and incomplete overview uh, um, uh, of these uh, contributions, and then we will go uh, into some details in the next uh, um, several slides. So uh, one contribution uh, that we um, uh, discovered to our initial astonishment, but quite logical, actually, is the uh, contribution of these distinct novel um, transposable elements that we dubbed casposons uh, 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 that employ homolog, and 
the likely ancestor of uh, Cas1 protein as the transposase or uh, integrase. Mm. It appears most likely uh, that uh, casposons contributed not only Cas1 uh, gene to CRISPR Cas systems, but probably Cas4 gene as well as uh, uh, the uh, uh, prototypical repeats themselves, probably as a duplication of uh, transposon target size. We'll talk a little more about this later. Uh, the, the very, uh, uh, so a very different type of transposable elements, non-autologous transposable elements of so-called, uh, non-autonomous transposable elements from the so-called IS605 superfamily, contributed the nucleases, the effector nucleases, to all uh, these type, uh, type 5, as well as type 2, uh, Cas9, uh, CRISPR-Cas systems. This big protein, trans protein from transposable elements uh, became uh, the effector nuclease. Now, mm, very different uh, type of uh, mobile elements. Toxin and titoxin modules uh, that are extremely common in uh, uh, archaea uh, and bacteria uh, and that do not have the, um, uh, the, their own encoded modes for active replication, unlike transposable elements. Uh, but they still uh, behave in many ways like mobile elements, primarily piggybacking on plasmids. So these made multiple contributions uh, to the evolution of this CRISPR-Cas system. One of these contributions is Cas2 that comes from this family of um, uh, toxin RNases. The other is uh, multiple HEP endomates, which come from another family of um, toxin ribonucleases. Then again, uh, as we shall see in more detail shortly, uh, um, uh, there is a distinct, uh, uh, sub, I, I wouldn't say subtype, but a distinct variant of type 3 CRISPR-Cas systems that contains a reverse uh, uh, an integrated reverse transcriptase that clearly comes from yet another type of model elements from group two introns. Finally, I mentioned the uh, reverse movement, the movement of entire CRISPR-Cas systems as well as individual enzymes, in particular Cas4 on many occasions, to phages, plasmid, and transposons. More about this in a uh, in a few moments, so here, in a few moments, so here I want to uh, say a few words uh, about uh, the origin of uh, class two um, uh, effectors from transposon encoded and toxin nucleases. So effectors are nucleases, so uh, um, logically, uh, um, uh, they evolve by boring uh, nucleases from other uh, um, types of uh, elements. Um, so as I already said, uh, mm, there, there are apparently independent events of TNPB nucleases uh, coming from different families of related but distinct families of transposable elements and forming uh, mm, type 5 effectors. And then a very distinct family of transposable elements that we identified primarily in cyanobacteria uh, uh, giving rise uh, to type 2 effectors, uh, Cas9. And toxins, or perhaps through other CRISPR-Cas associated ancillary proteins, giving rise to um, type 6 effectors with the two HEPN domains. All right, uh, so we will now go into some details of, of these different associations of CRISPR-Cas systems with model elements. Uh, and uh, here I would uh, like to begin uh, uh, by uh, quoting this uh, remarkable uh, uh, paper from um, Andy Fires Lab at Stanford, uh, which appeared uh, a year ago um, and uh, uh, demonstrated that um, in various uh, uh, type 3 uh, CRISPR Cas systems, the fusion proteins of reverse transcriptase and Cas1 enabled the acquisition of RNA spacers in a reverse transcriptase uh, uh, dependent uh, manner. As we eloquently indicate here, these observations outline a host-mediated mechanism 
for a reverse information flow from RNA to DNA. Apparently, the biological sort of logic here behind this is that um, the system recognizes actively or um, transcribe foreign DNA and uh, makes these spaces from transcripts. Um, no, but inspired by this and in, in uh, cooperation uh, um, uh, with Sacred Sailors and others uh, from um, Andy Fire's lab, we undertook a very uh, detailed uh, comparative genomic uh, investigation of um, uh, reverse transcriptase containing type 3 uh, uh, systems. And the remarkable thing that I want to, um, as you see, these, these uh, architectures are very diverse and we cannot go into the details, uh, uh, but what <coughs> remarkable thing that I want to emphasize here um, is that this RT Cas1 module still behaves in a way as a model element, although probably um, lost the ability uh, for um, uh, independent movement. Nevertheless, it be, uh, uh, the recombination is so rampant uh, um, that it behaves pretty much like a model element combining with any kind of, of uh, um, type 3 uh, um, um, effector uh, module. Uh, um, so we will uh, now look into the reverse transcriptase uh, um, phylogeny. Uh, um, uh, and map on it uh, uh, these uh, um, uh, fusions uh, um, uh, with uh, um, Cas1 uh, um, uh, um, Cas1 protein and another uh, um, recently discovered very interesting uh, fusion between Cas6 reverse transcriptase uh, and Cas1. And what we uh, um, see here uh, um, is that um, uh, these were uh, indeed uh, single events that I um, initially uh, brought uh, the um, uh, reverse transcript is coming from group two intron, that is group two intron, um, inserting uh, in the vicinity of, um, of uh, um, Cas1 gene, the association being fixed, resulting subsequently in fusion of uh, um, in a single fusion of um, um, RT in, and Cas1 that gave rise to all of these distinct adaptation modules, and then a single fusion of Cas6 with the RT uh, uh, Cas1 protein. So oh, there were always in each of these uh, um, uh, cases uh, um, uh, um, single founding events uh, for the formation of these uh, unusual adaptation modules. I switch subject to, um, uh, the subject a little bit now to another uh, group of uh, transposable elements. And what we see here uh, is, so to speak, crossing to the other side. Uh, that is um, insertion of class one crispr cas systems in transposons, plasmids, and viruses. The most remarkable and interesting of this I think, no, I don't know really which one is most remarkable and interesting they all are. Uh, but the one they explored in detail uh, was this. Uh, the integration of mi minimal effector modules of um, uh, type uh, um, uh, one, uh, of uh, class one, uh, into uh, um, transposons of the TN7 family. Uh, um, uh, why I call them minimal? Uh, um, uh, because uh, uh, they contain uh, no um, uh, adaptation module, and they contain no Cas3, only four Cas proteins here. So there are two subtypes that inserted apparently independently <coughs> uh, into TN7-like transposons, and we'll uh, uh, discuss uh, the function in a um, proposed function in a moment. Uh, but then there are also other uh, sort of minimal variants of CRISPR-Cas, in particular type 4, that, uh, on a number of, that travel primarily on uh, uh, plasmids. And then, finally, there, is, um, there are cases of um, incorporation of complete CRISPR-Cas systems of subtype 1F into uh, bacteriophage uh, genomes. So between uh, these different 
peculiar variants of CRISPR Cas systems, uh, we observe incorporation literally in all kinds of uh, model elements. Mm. So a little bit on the uh, evolution of the uh, association of uh, CRISPR uh, uh, Cas systems uh, into uh, TN7 uh, like uh, transposable um, elements. So we do, um, in order to understand this evolution, we do the familiar thing already. Uh, we build phylogenetic trees for these different genes and uh, map these associations onto uh, um, uh, these uh, trees. And when we do the tree for Cas7F uh, protein, the most conserved of these effector proteins incorporated into in transposons, we see the monophyletic origin of, of the mm, mm, transposon uh, mm, integration. When we do uh, phylogenetic trees for the transposon proteins, we actually observe, very interestingly, that there have been three independent insertions of CRISPR-Cas systems into um, uh, TN7, uh, mm, namely the largest, the most, the one that proliferated the most, type 1F, and the more rare two independent occasions of integration of subtype uh, uh, 1B. So, unfortunately, I cannot present you experimental data yet uh, on um, uh, what these systems do. But so surely I can present you a speculation. Um, and the speculation goes thus. Uh, you know, that, uh, um, I should mention that uh, you know, the uh, arrays uh, um, found in these uh, um, transposable elements do contain spacers with <coughs> matches. These matches are sometimes to plasmids, sometimes to uh, genomic regions uh, next to the uh, transposon um, uh, attachment sites. Uh, so given the absence of the nuclease, uh, um, of the effector nuclease of uh, um, Cas3 protein, uh, uh, we speculate here uh, that these systems in, in the transposon acquired a very different function, namely they might facilitate, might facilitate transposon integration via guide RNA mediated mechanism. Um, recognizing, uh, um, doing the typical CRISPR thing, uh, minus target cleavage. Recognizing the, the, the protospacer in DNA, or creating an R loop, and then, and, and so um, targeting um, the transposon to a particular area, something to be tested experimentally, obviously. So, thinking about all these multiple contributions uh, of um, uh, various kinds of model elements to the evolution of CRISPR-Cas, and also thinking about how the mysterious origins of the effector complexes of diverse uh, uh, class one systems. We do not really understand where they come from. Kira and I just suggested this speculation, uh, uh, whereby uh, the, uh, the casposon uh, uh, that um, uh, gave rise to the adaptation module of the ancestral CRISPR Cas systems was actually a highly complex entity with multiple cargo uh, genes. Uh, and so, uh, I think this is a distinct and interesting possibility that the entire ancestral CRISPR-Cas system comes from a single complex casposon. Uh, we do not, well, uh, uh, it is difficult to test this directly, but I think the further study of the diversity of these transposable elements will go a long way to providing potentially some supporting evidence for this hypothesis. And now I want to uh, um, switch uh, gears more seriously. And from the cast genes and the origins and the perturba uh, perturbations of the evolution, uh, I want to speak about the spacer space of the uh, CRISPR-Cas system. And my conclusion will be um, that actually all or nearly all spacers also come from a species-specific set of the model elements, what we call the mobilon. Um, for short. Well, so at some point a few months ago, we decided that we really need to dissect the spacer space 
Um, so, uh, to speak, and what do you do when you want to do this? Uh, in computational biology, that's like the pipeline. Uh, uh, so, in, in this case, uh, our pipeline involved uh, um, Grace Priori identification, usually using the union of predictions of Grace for Finder and Finder CR. And then we developed uh, a procedure into the details of which I cannot really go, but I think it works well, uh, that filters for both positives. Because this uh, uh, procedure is quite actually comprehensive in detecting CRISPR repeats, uh, but there is, you have to pay for that uh, by a considerable fraction of false positives. So we devised a certain way to eliminate them, and then we did searches with spacer against the entire um, mm, genomic and metagenomic databases uh, with a cons highly conservative threshold, which, depending on the length of the spacer, um, could, uh, could allow one or uh, two uh, mm, uh, mismatches um, in order to uh, mm, minimize the number of uh, false positives, even uh, also false positives, even at the cost of losing some sensitivity, perhaps, and then we classified the matches in the way. Um, that we shall see in a moment. So this is just a, as an introduction to this uh, mm, uh, whole thing, uh, mm, uh, distribution of the CRISPR arrays uh, among uh, mm, uh, various types of subtypes of CRISPR cas And there is, uh, uh, let's note that over 25% um, uh, mm, uh, of the uh, CRISPR cas uh, of the CRISPR arrays are um, associated with incomplete loci or are simply orphans, do not have uh, cas uh, genes. So, spacers with matches. We generally know uh, mm, uh, that there aren't that many, the fraction is not that large, but here is the uh, complete census uh, across uh, the bacterial uh, and archaeophyla, and we have these numbers, uh, about 7% on average. These are rather broad range. Uh, from no spacers with matches at all to 18%, a considerable number of, mm, in, no, actually, no, I made a mistake, I'm sorry. Uh, I missed the largest number here, 23% uh, in spire case. What kind of biology, biology of, of these organisms it reflects? We can only speculate for now. Probably very interesting aspects of this biology. Uh, mm, uh, and here is the dissection uh, mm, uh, uh, by the um, uh, types and subtypes of CRISPR cas systems. <coughs> Understandably, the, the same average and about the same range, again, showing that they work, uh, function uh, mm, uh, very differently uh, with respect to the dynamics of spacer accumulation and loss. Now, uh, what are those spacer matches? Now we only uh, mm, classify uh, those 7% that for which we can detect protons, protons, for which we detect matches, which in actuality are uh, proton spacers. Uh, mm, so, um, you know, what we see here, not unpredictably, but they will say rather strikingly, uh, that uh, mm, uh, the considerable majority, on average, about 75 to 80 percent, typically, uh, come uh, from um, uh, viruses, including proviruses. The small fraction comes from so-called intergenic regions. Uh, mm, uh, when we go in and actually look at those intergenic regions, it turns out that, unfortunately, these are mostly problems of microbial genome annotation and their genes there. Mm, okay, so, uh, and then there is a fraction of, um, uh, on the order of 15 to 25 percent on very, on very few occasions, or more of hits to uh, genes of, of no of viral, or, or of non-viral origin in microbial genomes. So, uh, uh, let's then look at the so-called non-viral matches. What we see here is very remarkable, uh, that they do not really hit. We do not really find proton spacers in regular microbial genes, housekeeping genes, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, but we find a considerable, uh, the great majority 
of, more of these non-viral matches in genes that are mm, uh, uh, implicated in plasmid replication and conjugation. As well as, interestingly, and already reported by Francisco Mojica, in a different context uh, to cast genes themselves. So, mm, so basically what we can conclude from here, I will repeat this more than once, but um, you know, what we can conclude from here is that nearly all spacers actually come from the model world, from different kinds of model elements, viruses and plasmids. Uh, mm, so it was interesting to construct this sort of CRISPR host virus uh, mm, uh, network, <laughs> Uh, mm, demonstrating the, here uh, mm, uh, the uh, red circles are host uh, mm, uh, bacteria and archaea, uh, and mm, uh, green uh, <coughs> circles are viruses, uh, demonstrating that while uh, the majority of the spacers are quite um, species specific, there is a small but interesting fraction of those that connect different species, apparently uh, reflecting uh, mm, model elements of our specificity. We also show uh, that there is a substantial, maybe we should say dramatic, excess of spacers and matches in the beginning of arrays, indicating that the majority of spacers have, are young, have been uh, acquired rather recently. And the final matter that I want to cover, perhaps the most exciting matter, but, uh, is the origin of the 93% of the spacerome, so to speak, without matches, without detectable protospacer, the dark matter. All right. Uh, mm, so, of course, the dark matter is dark. There are no, we cannot find homology there. Uh, mm, uh, but, but we can look at uh, mm, uh, various features. And the first and the simplest is looking at the GC content of the hosts, spacers, and associated pages. Um, and what we see here is that they span nearly entire range of uh, possible um, uh, GC uh, content values, and throughout <coughs> the entire range, they're nearly identical. Mm. Now, mm, uh, because it's, it's known generally that um, bacteriophages and prophages have um, lower GC content than the surrounding genomes, they are surprised by these observations, uh, mm, and so took a more detailed look into the uh, bacteria with well-characterized uh, virons and the spacers. What we show here is that spacers apparently tend to come from the most abundant viruses with GC content closest to the host. We proceeded with slightly more detailed analysis of oligonucleotide composition, principles of bonding analysis of dinucleotide composition of host spacers and viruses, and they're indistinguishable. They form just this one tight cloud, and the same uh, pertains to uh, tetranucleotides. And then additional analysis that I think are of certain, are rather revealing here, mm -hmm. and show uh, that all these spaces, including the um, uh, dark matter, come from fast evolving um, the sequences. What we did here basically is pre preparing a set of mock spacers, just um, mm, sampling a um, mm, mm, large number of oligonucleotides from the genome with the same length distribution uh, mm, as the spacers, and uh, looking into the mm, into the hits into uh, mm, uh, microbial genomes and different taxonomic ranges. Uh, mm, so what we see uh, here is that CRISPR spacers are uh, mm, uh, basically limited to closely related genomes, whereas um, random mock spacers, so to speak, come from all kinds of sources. And we also find that spacers are largely unique sequences, no repeats in the same genome. So what I conclude here is that the features of the dark matter spacers that we can analyze are indistinguishable from those of spacers with matches. They mm, come from fast evolving sequences that share uh, mm, the uh, sequence features with the host genomes and, uh, um, and the phages. So uh, what we conclude that, uh, and of, of course importantly, 
nearly all spaces that match it come from species specific modeling. So what we have to conclude, I think, that most likely the dark matter comes from the same source. And I will make my conclusions now from this entire presentation. Um, mm -hmm. So as we discussed, multiple diverse contributions of model elements to the um, mm, evolution of CRISPR-Cas, even the possibility that the entire system comes from a single ancestral complex transportable element. Uh, there is notable reverse flow, hijacking of CRISPR-Cas systems by transposons, plasmids, and viruses. And when we dissect the space around, we find that CRISPR spaces, including the dark matter, appear to come from species-specific models. Why are there so few spaces that we match? Well, clearly this is a co combination of two aspects. The one, fast amelioration, uh, mm, presumably uh, above all by, by uh, virus escape, <coughs> and two, the vast untapped modelomes and viromes that remain to be studied. Seems like it could be the case that all components of CRISPR-Cas systems come from, a, from different parts of the modelome. I want to mm, acknowledge Kira Makarova, Sergei Shmakov, and Yuri Wolf, the key members of my group working on CRISPR-Cas systems, Fan Zhang and his lab, without whose uh, collaboration, contribution, and support we simply wouldn't be doing any of this, probably. Uh, Joe Peters from Cornell, who is an expert on TM7 uh, transposons. Konstantin Severinov, who also contributed to um, the study of the space of the Severin Seward and MD5 from Stanford, uh, for their contribution to the um, mm, RT. Uh, containing uh, to the study of the RT containing Lose. And thank you all very much for attention. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, so I was curious for the RNA targeting CRISPR systems that do not have an RT-Cas1 fusion, when you look at the spacers, do they tend to map more frequently to the coding strand than the non-coding strand for ORFs, something like that? They map to... Mm, mm, mm. Uh, to the coding strain, that is, uh, mm, uh, the, the, mm, uh, the, the polarity is compatible with the reverse transcription of transcripts and, and the incorporation. Yes, but, in, in, but this, that's also true when they, there's no reverse, obvious CAS reverse transcriptase present in the genome. Is that? Okay, so, uh, uh, all you can say in this subject is, is that uh, the, the, uh, I think the entire, the entire scheme is compatible with the reverse transcription of, of transcripts. Uh, or do you mean some, some other, something else that I'm not catching? Uh, no, no, that was what I meant. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. I have a very naive question. So if CAS system is developed to fight off uh, infection of microorganisms, is there any uh, link to restriction enzyme world because those are also yes. essentially work the same function? Um, yes. Uh, um, that is a very interesting question and I, um, mm, the, 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 there is a major distinction uh, mm, uh, the, mm, in that restriction modification system that in 18 unity pretty much there is this is adaptive. On the other hand there are similarities as well. Of the similarities, even at the level of shared elements, because, for instance, CAS4 has uh, the same at the center, the same nucleus fold uh, as restriction uh, 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 nucleases, uh, but also a deeper uh, similarity in the sense of uh, uh, that restriction modification systems uh, behave like toxin and data. Toxin and the chemical antidote. And the crystal of the antidote being the modification of that. Um, and 
Uh, the CRISPR Cas system also, as I pointed out, uh, contains a number of toxins that don't kill the cell. And therefore, there should be some antitoxins. This, unfortunately, has not yet been studied in sufficient detail. So I think that along with the major distinction, there are some rather fundamental similarities. Okay, thank you. So the TN7 uh, story that you presented is a very bold hypothesis that perhaps these transposons are hijacking um, the CRISPR uh, guide RNA machineries to, to uh, transpose themselves. Have you analyzed the spacers uh, on those transposon, transposon encoded CRISPR systems to see are they targeting perhaps enzymes that are inhibitory uh, to the transpose, transposition process? Oh, we have analyzed the space of the uh -huh. oh, and found a great green not say for sure, uh -huh. oh, but they found no such effect. What we did find is that some of them oh, met, met quite close to the attachment uh -huh. sites for the transport. 